Um, so for those of you that don't know uh, Steve, um, Steve McLeod is a practicing photographer as well. Uh, he's represented by Black Box Gallery. Um, he's also the director of Metro Imaging and is quite heavily involved with um, photography education. Um, so Steve studied an MA in photochemical chemistry. Um, during this time, he developed several organic methods of creating kind of light sensitive dyes from things including walnuts and um, potatoes. So we're really yeah, excited to have you today talking to us and thank you very much for joining us all and sharing your insights. Um, so this week during the Sustainable Darkroom Residency, our theme is repurpose. So we've been really investigating things that we already have around us. Um, and in light of our current situation, it's really interesting to see, you know, what we have at home and in the garden and how we can re reutilize this and rethink um, what we're working with and how things can become an image or can um, be light sensitive and act as a as a way of creating yeah photographic imagery um so yeah it would be really interesting to kind of hear from you steve how you first when you were studying your ma um what kind of first sparked your interest in exploring these more uh plant-based uh photosensitive dyes Hi everybody. Hi Hannah. Uh, thank, many thanks for inviting me on to uh, the talk. Um, I must say it's a bit like show and tell this this talk because I've never actually spoken in public about these experiments that I've done whilst I was a student uh, at Great School of Art in Aberdeen. And prior, it all really started uh, before I'd actually gone to university because prior to that I was an engineer. I was an electrical engineer, worked on oil platforms and done a variety of different things. Um, and I suppose in my photography, I brought along a kind of analytical approach to what I was doing uh, and by way of experimentation, uh, by way of exploring the medium of photography beyond actual image making. And I think whilst I was at university, I, I was really got into the art of printing um, and the act of making uh, photographs rather than, I suppose, taking them. Um, and through the process of that passion for different methods of image making from working in offset life of you know, Heidelberg presses, screen printing, darkroom printing, uh, all of these things all would combine into uh, my, my interest and, and slight obsession with process. And I suppose it really influences what I do today, uh, both as an artist, and my work is very much process led, but also as a director of Metro Imaging, I'm sort of renowned as the person at the company who tries to break things that are new. So new technologies, new ways of you know, creating work. And, and I enjoy that sort of, not the breaking, but the actual experimentation and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Um, so I'm kind of in a very fortunate position uh, with the job. And I think furthermore, in education as well, I enjoy the challenge of meeting the students and encouraging them to push the boundaries uh, outside of their comfort zone. Uh, in terms of what's possible. But going back to the uh, uh, original uh, impetus, I suppose, um, uh, I've got a few props and things, so I'll just pull things up on the screen as and when they're, they're sort of required. But as a student, I was very much involved in looking at photography outside of pho photography in terms of how it was perceived and how it was viewed. Uh, I was very much more interested in how it would be, you know, the how it's made rather than why. You know, I didn't come from a very sort of academic background and I must admit I struggled a lot uh, with the sort of contextual side of things when I was a student. So very much for me, my natural go-to place would be actually creating something physical. Um, I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, I very much like being outside. I'm an outside sort of person. I have a great appreciation for landscape, for nature, for the environment, and always have. And I was brought up very much uh, in my childhood um, you know, with my family having a, a small holding and having a farm. Uh, we had an animal sanctuary when I was very young and we continued that on for many, many years. So I had very much appreciation of the natural environment. And I was also very aware uh, as a student of, you know, to, to be honest, the amount of pollutants that were being used in photography. 
uh, the ways that we were just hap you know, willy-nilly discarding chemistry, uh, thinking about the manufacture of products and how you know, incrementally damaging it was to the environment. And, and I was actually felt that I was contributing to that as well. Uh, because I was as bad as anybody else with my rolls of film, my darkroom printing, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And even down to how you frame things and what framing materials we would use. So it was always sort of front and center of what, what I was doing and, and what I was aware of uh, everybody else is doing as well. So I started to look at different printing processes. Uh, and at the time I was working on a process which was something rather experimental, which is more akin to printmaking. So this is um, uh, a litho print uh, from an individual black and white negative. It was a bit of a challenge I'd set myself in terms of image registration uh, and, and how to uh, control the, the, the process of, of exposure and, and things. And at that time I was using these kind of negatives. I don't know if you can see these very well. Um, so these were negatives I would make in a darkroom and uh, from a negative I'd make enter negatives which would give me a positive and I'd make you know and then you'd end up with these and I would layer the exposures um, to create denser and thinner negatives and this really taught me more about negative production for contact printing than it did teach me about lithographic printing or even darkroom printing from original negatives or at that time when I was making R types from transparencies. So it, it, I really learned the craft of process, of processing contact negs and what they could be used for. And I think that's something that's fundamental, particularly if you're, you're creating artworks with a discernible, with an image based sort of uh, process. So, I learned an awful lot and I, and I had a lot of these sort of negatives lying around. I created a body of work uh, inspired by the landscape uh, in the Highlands of Scotland and made a series of these um, sort of prints that you see. Uh, so this is very early on in my, my education. And I was always encouraged really to experiment with uh, printing processes in a way and, and, and to appreciate them in, in, in a way that wasn't how they were originally intended. But from there uh, I started to look at uh, alternative processes. That was my real introduction. Uh, I think probably about 1989 uh, I started looking at early photography. Pictorial movement was very, you know, and my own work was something that I was very much interested in. And so I would look at early photographic media. Um, photographic practitioners and how they would make work. And I became very much interested in gum bichromate, brome oil, uh, all these different alternative processes. But my go-to was always salt printing. Um, for some reason, I absolutely love, I love salt printing. I love, I appreciate what they look like. I appreciate the, the making of what's involved with them. Uh, and that's at a point of departure, I started making salt prints. And there was an interesting book that I picked up uh, by a friend of mine who was, who was my tech at the time, he was our uni tech, and his name was um, Stuart Johnston, and he gave me a book called Keepers of Light, uh, which I subsequently have not got anymore. I think I know where it is, but it's, it's not me that's got it. Um, but it's, um, it was fascinating, actually, uh, as an eye-opener for me to, you know, who have been very much used to looking at a lot of contemporary ways of making photographs. But... And this is the days before, you know, the digital. And I was fascinated by that book. That book was my kind of Bible. I, I read it, I read it, and read it over and over and over. And I thought there's actually no point just reading things. If you want to really understand something, you have to do, you have to make. Uh, and I found that uh, a big challenge, uh, both from a uh, chemical perspective of things. You know, sort of studying photomechanical sciences is something that's actually not, Something very attractive doesn't sound very attractive, but um, I like the idea of mixing processes. Uh, I like the idea of challenging a process and what can be achieved and what the outcomes are. And and I think what's it, what I also like is the idea of failure. And that might sound that we all sort of aim to be successful and have successful outcomes uh, in, in producing. But I think success is relative. Um, and I'm very much a, a big advocate of 
you know, trying things and failing and trying again and failing and that sort of idea of that we well, learn every time you fail, you will always learn something new. And, and that became a, a big driver for me. And I was always encouraged uh, to be like that, both growing up and in my sort of uh, higher education and beyond that into work, I suppose. And I've always encouraged for others to be that way too. So I started experimenting with salt prints as we know them. Uh, there's the standard keepers of light uh, formula that I would use. I think there was a gelatin and salt uh, recipe. I can share these the recipes, but they're, they're common. You'll find them uh, on the internet. So I was looking at the standard salt printing processes. So, so formula one was using a gelatin and a salt-based formula. And the second one was a starch and salt-based formula. And so I went through a process of um, doing the usual thing, just practicing, uh, trying things out. Um, I must admit, I got better results with the gelatin uh, salt process. It was more even. Um, starch was a bit more haphazard, I suppose. It, it, you get arrow root starch, you get all sorts of different sort of starches that you can get. And, and I think it was maybe down to maybe the chemicals that I was using at the time, but it was, it was more successful using gelatin. Now, obviously gelatin is an animal based product. Um, and it's something that, you know, I didn't like the sound of actually using it. Something as a byproduct. Um, people may say it as a waste product, but maybe we shouldn't have it in the first place. Um, so I went through a process of, of developing a standard uh, salt printing to a degree of success. To be completely honest, it became boring uh, and not a challenge anymore. Um, and through the process of my education, I, I had to sort of deconstruct uh, the chemical elements of, of different uh, makeup in, in, in full science. Um, and I started to look at the basis of salt printing and what these things were. And it, I must admit, the, the ethical element of it, uh, you know, for a period of time was not at the forefront of what I was trying to achieve. It was the kind of how can I make this different? And I was walking down the bridge of D, down by the River D outside Aberdeen one day, uh, weirdly looking at dead salmon. Uh, after the sort of breeding season and things. Sounds very romantic, it wasn't. Um, and I came across walnut, a walnut tree. I'd never seen a walnut tree in my life. And I found a walnut tree by the bank of the river and the walnuts were on the tree and off the tree. So I picked them up and a walnut actually doesn't look like a walnut that you might buy in the supermarket. It's, it's, it's a husk, it has a husk on it and it's a sort of smooth green rounded you know it looks like the size of one of these potatoes that i've got here this is a semi-dead potato it needs to go in the ground because it's seeding anyway um i was peeling and cracking open the walnuts and i found that when i was cracking them open the oil on the inside of the husk was going black um as i was peeling them and by the time i got home my hands were completely black from where I'd been peeling these walnuts. And that triggered something into, into me, something like looking at organic materials to produce something akin to a salt print. Uh, and I started looking at different sort of compounds, boiling potatoes to get starch, boiling rice to get starch, boiling pasta to get starch, and then dehydrating it, and then using it and boiling it down while I was using it. I started using lemons, limes, other citric sort of uh, fruits that you might find, experimenting with those. Um, and I started looking at, uh, you know, with, with the starch, I could use an alternative as an alternative to gelatin. So that's sort of my get out of jail card for that one. And, you know, looking at sea salt for sodium chloride, you know, looking at um, salt water in terms of, you know, a boil, you know, sort of drying salt to basically to get sea salt as they do now for culinary reasons. And so it's a very simplistic and straightforward trajectory for me to try and explore uh, what I was doing. It was full of uh, issues, um, both in terms of stability, but also in terms of exposure latitude uh, for, for the prints. Um, what I found out, walnut, the, the, the walnut husk was very unstable. Um, and very reactive, very much a reactant uh, uh, material 
But I did try, I did, I persevered and I got somewhere. Uh, I can show you, this was one of my sort of early attempts, you might say. A bit faded now. It's, um, it was 1989, possibly a bit later. So it looks a bit better than I do when I was probably at that age. But, um, and what I would do, I'd use a different coating method. So rather than, uh, I love coating by brush, you know, you're using, a, using a, a, a proper brush or by rod. But with these, I would dip them. I would dip them, and that's why they're trimmed. They're trimmed out because I, I so they're sort of rudimentary. It's very, very basic. Um, Just to clarify, would, Steve, yeah. is this using the potato or the walnut? This yeah. One? So this is one of my first early attempts. With the potato? Uh, with, with potato, lemon, sea salt, and, and uh, walnut oil. Oh. It looks terrible, if I'm honest. Uh, but hey ho. Uh, I then persevere a bit more. And again, going back to my sort of, these are done with contact necks. Uh, I made this. This is shocker, this one. Um, so monochrome. Uh, and. But in comparison to the previous one, you've got such, such yeah, a black there. Everything that I do. I'm free to admit it's a process of elimination and mark making, mistake making, evaluation, assessment, readdressing, and going back. So that I could see, you know, I, the hope is, is an evolution in, in what I do. Um, rather, you know, but, you know, so I suppose nine times out of 10, it's, it's the abject disaster, but that's fine because I learned something from it um so yeah so it looks a lot better and the reason is it was more about it was controlling the the um relationship between starch and walnut you know which effectively was silver nitrate it was a replacement for silver nitrate and what i found was that it's all about age uh, and humidity and it's something I learned I brought into commercial salt printing uh, in the early 2000s there's a lost science in salt printing to do with everything's about rehumidifying papers uh, potentially when you um, come to salt your, your print but it's actually there's an aging that, that is required over time and I got this amazing book uh, you can see I've looked after it. Um, I can't remember when it's published. I think it was published in 1898 or something, 18, 1880. Uh, and it's a book called Historical Sketch of Early Photography. And this is the only book I ever found about that, got, that recommends aging sized paper prior to salting in the dark. Interesting. Uh, and Gerard Annier and I experimented with this uh, over six months. And we found that by aging papers uh, more and more and more, um, we could get more successful outcomes with commercial printing. But it harks back to when I was a student, because when I was a student and I was experimenting, I was always sort of, you got your time in the dark room and then somebody else would have to get in, so you'd have to get out. So I would be uh, sizing. Uh, paper ready for salt printing, boxing it up and then having to go off and do something else. And what I found was that those papers that were um, left to age effectively uh, perform better. Now, I don't know the science behind it, but it kind of got me thinking about, okay, there are so many different elements of this that are written about, but we don't know about. Um, I think a lot of uh, craftspeople back in the day would hand down their information by the act of doing rather than describing or talking. And that's why I think with what you guys are doing with London Alternative Photography is actually brilliant because you're, you're allowing access to those minds, so that knowledge base and that ability for your community to share information uh, and to learn from each other. So, you know, you know I'm actually delighted to be doing this. Um, this is another attempt. 
better than that one. Yeah, getting much more successful. I find I can get more control, I think, in the mid-tone values. Mm -hmm. So things sort of in here. This was all like block out. Whereas this, uh, this has actually been toned in selenium as well. Uh, prior to it, so it's not strictly speaking an organic print, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's. I like the color. <laughs> it's the simplest term. I like the color. Um, the only but, difference between these three is the aging of the paper. The aging and also the mix. So it's the sort of balance uh, between them. I went. I think I went from lemons to limes. <laughs> I think so. Please, anybody, don't ask me why that makes any difference. But it made a huge difference going from lemon to lime. Maybe it's something to do with the amount of sodium that's within a lime in, or within you know, within a lime. I haven't got any limes. I drank all that out with gin and tonic. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, but, uh, um, don't have any have any limes. I've got a lemon. Um, but yeah, I started using limes. Uh, but I did find as a student that limes are a lot more exotic in Aberdeen and it's much more expensive as well. So uh, I had to make do with what I had. Um, but that was it, really. I sort of went from that to um, doing album. Uh, commercially, I was working as a printer. So I was a black and white printer for many years and worked with some of the world's most amazing and some of the most unamazing clients. Uh, and it's something that I've always enjoyed. Uh, it's not only pushing the boundary of what uh, I've done, but it's what their potential is as well. And uh, as part of that process, I've worked commercially as an alternative. For, I hate calling it alternative as well, because it's an alternative to what? It's just printing. It's a method of, to me, it's just a way of expression. I can't, I, I can't abide this alternative kind of, it's, it's historical. It's not historical because it's contemporary. Yeah, there's no no good substitute word for it, I think. Is it like the London Photography Collective? <laughs> Just put a pause in there. A pause, a dramatic <laughs> pause. That's what we need. Anyway, I'm doing an album on print. So myself and a lovely, lovely French inventor, engineer, craftsman, genius, Gerard Annie. Uh, designed and built an album on coating device um, because we could and it worked to a degree and for anybody who wants to know so album on came after uh, salt in a way it became a sort of upgraded version of a salt print because you've got a glossy finish and an album print there became the precursor for what we know as print out paper and then darker on paper so the sort of the vapor trail was was is always there um, and, and silver nitrate obviously is still used to this day. Uh, but I think going back to the, what, the use of walnut, lemons, limes, potatoes, uh, sea salt, uh, I think this idea of psychologically in a way, and I think emotionally, it makes you look at things in a different way. It makes me feel differently. And the idea of this is about repurposing. You know, I was out the other day collecting da dandelion flowers from my neighbor's tortoise because they haven't got a small garden. They haven't got, they're not got dandelions like us. So I kept them and I was scrunching them as I was grabbing them. And the dye started to darken again like the walnut. Mm. So I made, oh, sh I, I made it. I, I put it in a photogram. I, I, I diluted in, down the dandelion heads with distilled water. Um, and then I soaked a sheet of paper in it, Arsh Aquarelle paper in it, um, which is unsized, and left outside in the sun two days ago. And I got a discernible image on there. Now, I haven't fixed it, but I'm just fascinated by what things do. Or what, or, and I think, you know, I'm also fascinated by the fact that when people tell you to do something, I tend to do the opposite, um, or, or think the opposite, maybe. Um, and that has in the past got me into a lot of trouble, but I think at the same time, I've used it, I think, in terms of my photographic education. I just rambled on and on and on, haven't I? Who's that? No, not at all. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mum picking out some flowers. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. 
so um she's really throwing me off now <laughs> <laughs> um so what why, what was um your reason for kind of stopping continuing to develop working with these materials i think work commitments um as i say i was a i, I became sort of the servant for others in a way uh, I became, a, I was a very successful uh, black and white printer. Um, I've published a book, which is, you get it in five languages. Oh, cool. Uh, and it demystifies the art of printing. So it's a book that I produced. Uh, and each page tells you exactly what I did with the print. Um, and I think... That was probably uh, very good on my part to publish that, but at the same time, it was my bit of a downfall because I became more in demand as a printer, I think, and that took over from my own work and my own ability to experiment because I was working six days a week, 14 hours a day in a darkroom uh, commercially. Um, I then set up my own lab, uh, which is really successful but I became a businessman uh, and as successful as that is I think there are certain responsibilities that you have to the business and therefore some things some you know have to take a, a, a sort of a mar go into the margin for a period of time and I don't view that as a sort of negative thing I think it's something more to do with the idea of it it sometimes allows you more time to think uh, about experimenting think about process think about how things are do and you can apply that in anything in life i believe uh, and so I, I gave up that element of, of experimentation probably in the mid to late 2000s um i'm happy to say that you know in my own practice i'm still experimenting i'm experimenting even more uh, uh, my gallery black box projects are, are really push me to that extent uh, and, and really make me rethink uh, photography and, and the way that I present it. And I think the, the mindset hasn't changed. It's the implementation of technique or process that maybe has with technology. Uh, and I always say to students now that there's no better time to be in photography than now. Uh, because you have all of these means, you know, at your, in your hands. But also there's tutorials online. There's, you know, there's the web. Everything is there for you. Um, and and it's, the only thing restricting you is actually your imagination. Um, and so, you know, I'm still experimenting. I'm experimenting even more. Um, I've been doing huge large-scale photograms uh, that I did in the Middle East. I did a massive project in the Middle East where I was pouring paint inside my 10.8 camera uh, as I was making exposures. Um, this is a thing I did. So this is printed on a plank of wood. I'll do this, come sort of like stage left, stage right. <laughs> like that. Those are shot on my iPhone. Uh, Martin Barnes encouraged me to do something a bit more immediate and it was a project called Traverse that I did. Um, this is printed on a bit of slate. And if you look at my Instagram, I posted three images last week of things I've been printing on and putting in the garden. So bed sheets, um, slate, bits of wood. Um, so I, I don't think my love of process or my passion for experimentation has gone. It's, it's sometimes life, uh, it doesn't get in the way of it. And that's such a question. I think what it does is something you have to park it and there's yeah. responsibilities moved in another direction yeah if yeah. the if the research into the potato and lemon and walnut was further developed do you think it would have any commercial potential i think so i think uh, the barriers uh, i'd like to think so um i think the barriers might be uh, twofold one would be cost um and the other might be you know, an understanding of that cost and why it costs that amount. Um, 
I think we work in an immediacy. We work in a very sort of fast turnaround. Uh, and I like the idea of craft and the human element in craft and that you're visible and then you see it. I think, unfortunately, in the digital age, we, we go for the polish. You know, we look for the finesse. We look for continuity in a way. But for me, and consistency, but that you can have continuity and consistency with a human touch. Uh, and I think we've sort of lost some of those values, but I'm, I'm hoping through organizations like yourselves and others that we bring that back and uh, that we go back to craft without feeling that it's some kind of underground scene or something to be ashamed of or inferior. I see it as a higher thing, actually, because yeah. there's a higher seat of learning required for a craftsman than there is for tech, to be completely frank in, in many respects. Cool. I'm going to open it up now to see if anyone else has any questions that they want to ask Steve. I have a question. Um, I wondered if there was any toners that would be different to selenium that we could use that might be a bit more sustainable. Um, well, if... hi, Mel, how are you? Uh, I am. Um... <laughs> I I would use I've used tea so I've worked with a tea coffee, um, I suppose natural dyes I've dyed things with you know with sort of pulped tulip, um, so yeah it's it's I think the 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 it's not an issue I suppose I think the question would be is is about archival stability, and um, but I do tea tone and coffee tone prints for clients still. Uh, there was one client in particular, her body of work, where I, 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 uh, I, tea, I tone it in Darjeeling tea uh, because it gives a particular um, colour rendering. So I think things like that maybe. I mean, I went for selenium because it was there really. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's looking at toners versus dyes. If something gets dyed, it's dying everything. If something gets toned, and it's, it's coming converting or, or you know the 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 original that and if you question. didn't if you didn't tone those ones what color would they be are they like the first example uh, yeah, they'd be sort of more um yeah warmer mm -hmm. uh, less d max i think the blacks would be are more open if you look at look at that yeah uh, i know it's faded but in its original, I suppose it would look more like that. Mm -hmm. No, in terms of the warmth, you know, as open, open sure. shadows, um, and less of a, you know, a selenium particularly hardens blacks and it and it gives you a split, um, depending on how you use it. But uh, I think that's what it would be. It looked more like its uh, original state. Um, do you know Anand, the artist, a uh, uh, Scottish artist? Um, and he, if you look at his salt prints and his album prints, they're very warm, open, mm -hmm. sort of uh, organic material. So that's how they, I, that's how they look. Yeah. I, I, uh, I had a, a bit of a um, comment. Just wanted to say uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm really new to um, photography overall. But the um, the processes that you've been talking about and the processes that I've seen from the other people in the residency are, are really um, in line with a lot of the work that I do, which is around sort of um, exploring like pre-industrial uh, techniques, um, but using like post-capital materials. Mm -hmm. So this idea of like like you were saying like uh, sort of archaic knowledge, but updating it with new materials and um, new ways of thinking. And I just thought your, your comment about retaining agency was interesting. Um, when you said you got to, um, you were becoming too overwhelmed with your professional work. Mm. And so you had your other artistic work had to take a bit of a backseat. So um, yeah, I think there's like an, a pressure to uh, retain some sort of consistency in a, in a commercial sense. Mm. Um, and I just wanted to um, maybe talk further about the sort of the renaissance of craft and how this sort of post-capital thinking 
um, actually embracing the chaos and the idea of um, the inconsistencies of producing artworks is actually maybe um, where we should be putting a lot of our efforts uh, because it, it the sort of democratization of the materials um, the the proliferation of knowledge the redistribution of resources um, is kind of really vibrant and like it sort of shows solidarity with DIY processes through the years which have been fed into you know more more kind of cross-pollination of like science art I think, right, Sean, I think um, I'm I'm a great believer in craft, not only in terms of photography and uh, the visual arts, but I, I'm a trustee of an organisation called the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust, and it supports uh, great you know, crafts people, whether you're a thatcher or a photographer or a painter or a line drawer. Um, and it embraces this whole notion of the individual uh, as opposed to an organisation. Um, at, at the time that my commercial work came to the fore, uh, it's not to say I, I wasn't reluctant, I enjoyed every minute of it, and I still do. I, I love business, I love being in business, I love what you can do with business, and, and, and it allows me, I love people, I mean, I love meeting people and finding out about them and their stories and things. Um, I think some of the best work I did commercially were, was accidents. Um, if you look at Rankin's snog book, you look at uh, books by see John Nicholson on his cowboys or there's, there's many many things that with artists and photographers that I've worked on where uh, we came to it by accident uh, and the the difficulty for most then is consistency the challenge is then to repeat you know and I'm not it's not about repeating a whole body of work at any given time it's going back to it five years later and doing it again exactly the same and I became slightly obsessive with it, having the ability to do that. But I do think uh, the sacrifice was is that um, my own work, particularly my image making, and then how that should be represented in print, uh, slid. And I spent, we lived in the Middle East for a year or so, uh, and I came back to the UK in 2009. And it wasn't until then that I really picked my own work up again. Uh, and thought, am I going to do this and keep stuffing shop stuff? It's going to keep going under under the bed in a box, uh, or it's actually going to see the light of day and actually going to complete something. And that was a renewed impetus for me. And I, I had to, you know, put thing, putting things in perspective, but also get react, you know, resetting that balance uh, was important at that time. Uh, and it's something that I continue to try in this day. But I do believe in that, uh, sorry, that was my gallery director. Uh, I do think that um, the, the, the ability to, of craft to evoke an emotion within us is something that got lost, I think. In 2003, when uh, Canon and Nikon developed amazing digital cameras, well, I would say we amazing, amazing for their time. Uh, and I was working in industry, and within six months, we lost pretty much 75% of our analog uh, production. Uh, everybody wanted the new, brand new thing. I think the arts are cyclical, and something gets added on every time it, it goes around uh, this circle. Um, and I think now we have a greater appreciation, a greater understanding. And maybe technology and the internet has a, a, a part to play in that as well. So we couldn't just, don't just poo-poo technology as something that is negative and, you know, not to be uh, looked at uh, as a craftsperson. I think if you embrace technology, um, you can get these advancements in both your own understanding, but also then how that full, you know, feeds as a form of expression. Like I say, you know, if I were to say to you, what's that thing? I could print on a bit of slate five years ago. That would be a lot of rubbish. We couldn't do that five mm -hmm. years ago to that what I like to call quality. Um, now we do, now we can. And it's the yeah. same thing, you know, with, with 3D printing. You know, people are producing digital negs as opposed to having to do what I had to do in a dark room. 
So there's a lot of things that are readily available to us, but I always go back to the basics and that is my imagination and my sort of inquisitiveness uh, with, with what I'm doing with print. Yeah, uh, well, with and that's, that's the kind of thing that goes with you for life if you sort of continue to nurture it. Of course. Um, I very much think that, yeah, being an artist is um, like using a, using a bunch of tools rather than creating products. So I definitely agree with you. And I think also that um, the digitization of a lot of these uh, sort of traditional methods is not necessarily a bad thing because the new digital uh, tools become, you know, uh, become medium in their own, in their own right. And they can still be, they can still be um, affected by the hand. If you look at, I mean, I, I can see there's a place for it in, in, in contemporary practice. If you look at the gallery that represents me now, I was with another gallery for about 11 years and it's very much seen as a photography gallery. Whereas if you look at the gallery I'm with now, it's all driven about process. The artists that they have on the roster, it's all about the making of something and the presentation as part of that making. Uh, because I'd, I'd become sort of bored with creating a print and sticking it in a frame. It's very 1990s and I'm so over it. Uh, I'd rather look at sculpture. Weirdly, I'm not inspired by photography. That might sound for somebody who's so, so steeped in photography, but photography doesn't really interest me that much. Uh, I'm more inspired by painting, drawing, sculpture, and people. What's inside people's heads? You know, I, I think that for me is, is the, the interesting thing. Uh, and the technology that we have around us uh, and how you use it. Yeah, and it's a good tool for sharing as well, isn't it? So. Oh, massive, yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Um, hi, I, I um, support students who are making alternative work at a university. And I've had a lot of students ask about salt printing um, and I've always um, kind of driven them more towards Van Dyke due to the fact that there's less silver nitrate in yeah. the developer that's made. So when you said with um, making the developer commercially, it being quite high cost, is that due to the cost of walnut oil? No, when we did it commercially, we never used these organic uh, uh, media kit. We, what we used was very much silver nitrate. Okay. And silver nitrate uh, is it, it, a, a horrendously expensive material. Um, yeah. In this book, it actually tells you how to melt down silver coins to get the silver out of it. Um, I haven't tried it. Uh, maybe during lockdown, I'll give it a go um, to discover that it's not silver. Uh, no, we were using it commercially. We had to go to sort of proprietary sort of materials, and they are there are they are there is an incumbent sort of price and all of that. Um, I developed some commercial photographic papers with Ilford uh, around about two thousand three, two thousand and five, and worked with their scientists and engineers up at Moberly in Cheshire uh, to 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 bring this paper to market, and the amount of energy that was put into that r d was unbelievable um and it can be an incumbent for them but i would say yes none of us have bottomless pits of money uh, and and i think going forward things are, are going to be a challenge i would i would actually encourage them to do what i did find alternatives find things that are a bit different. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that you have to then put that to bed and then uh, think, oh, well, you know, that's the end of that. Who knows, five years time, 10 years time, that may revisit them and it will come back at some sort of point. So yes, I would say that commercially, it is expensive, these chemicals, but why not try a bit of walnut oils? Why not try some of these other processes that are um, what you might for don't conform to the expectation? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm really keen to to give it a go and see yeah. what um My what, effect advice, you can get. what I'll do is if you're doing the walnuts is when you get them and they're ripe, um wait till they fall, don't get them off the tree. Um, okay. 
a random conversation. Never thought I'd be having this on uh, on the Zoom. Uh, but wait, don't don't pull them off the trees. Wait till they drop because they're ripe. Okay. Take it off a tree, you'll be days trying to peel it open or cut it open, and by the time you do, you'll have you know wasted your time because the oil that the, is there, I think, to protect the the nut. Uh, it, it's just it's dried. It's not you know uh, ripened. Um, don't peel them in the field. Take them back to a dark room where there's no natural light. Um, and in low light conditions, then unhusk them. Okay. Uh, did you ever try using like commercially made um, walnut oil? I tried processed it, but it's been, uh, it's been pasteurized or something. Or something's been done to it, which it doesn't work. It didn't work for me. I did try okay. it. Oh, here's a cheapo. Here's a cheapo version off the shelf. Yeah, but... I was just. Thinking, <laughs> well, I quite like the peeling of walnuts and the idea of actually squeezing lemons and boiling potatoes and things. You know. Yeah. You can, eat, you can eat most of what you've got left over. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Encourage. Um, do, you, do, do you have a kind of rough rough recipe of that you could share with us? Yeah, so basically for a starch version of it, um, what I would end up, I, I actually use, I, I scrape out the husk and I put it in distilled water. I'll just tell you this bit now. I scrape out the husk and put it in distilled water. So you end up with milliliters rather than grams of material. Uh, so a rough guesstimate would be, so 200 milliliters of water, um, five grams of starch, so what I tend to do for the starch is boil, get good old Mars Piper or something like that, and loads of water because it will boil down. Uh, is boil up your um, uh, potatoes, and you get that frothy white stuff at the top. That's the starch. Cream that off uh, and put it in a, a bottle. Keep that. Um, all of this is pretty immediate. So. Um, then what I'll do is, is the sodium chloride is the sea salt. So now you can buy natural sea salt uh, flakes, um, or it's much more difficult to go and get some sea, sea water and then you know dry it out. Um, I would recommend getting some uh, sea salt flakes, but get some natural organic sea salt flakes that have been unprocessed. Mold and sea salt are a really good one. Uh, it's based here in Essex, uh, but they have a very pure. And there's another one on the Isle of Skye, I think, that is doing natural sort of sea salt. Uh, but you'll find it, you'll find that. And use six grams of that, okay? Um, so there's your water, 200 milligrams of water. Uh, you end up with like five milliliters of starch to that 200 milliliters, and six uh, grams, let's say, of sea salt. It's quite a potent, it's a strong salting, that is. Um, so uh, with the water, some people I've spoken to use distilled water for everything. Uh, others don't, even for boiling the potatoes, but I can't see any point in doing that. Um, so where people will use distilled water will pretend, depend on where they live. So geographically, they may have hard or soft water. Uh, so you have to look at the what the pH value of your water is. Uh, your is, it, is it something to do with the chlorine as well? Could be chlorine fluorides. Uh, it so depends you on. Just you, gas it off. Yeah, you can just leave water out overnight and it will gas off. Yeah, you know, it sort of gases off. If you leave a glass of water out overnight and then you drink it the next morning, it's a bit, it tastes a bit. <laughs> Uh, it is strange. Um, so some people, what what it ends up is you end up with a patchy image. Uh, you know, if it's irregular. So um, that's the water, that's the starch, that's the um, uh, salting thing. But also add, uh, now some people do this, and I have done it and I haven't done it, is they add some uh, citric acid into the salting mix, uh, you know, into the, sorry, into the um, starch mix. Um, and sort of embed all of that in. So they mix it all up and then soak the paper in there. Now I would generally soak the paper for a good 20 minutes. Um, dry it in the dark, if you can, uh, and then hang it up to dry. And then once it's dry, box it up in an old photographic print box or something like that. Keep it in the dark. Now, my recommendation is to leave it 
for weeks. It's a very quick process. There's a bit like snappy snaps and it salty snaps. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Steve? Mm -hmm. The walnut, it, have you ever done any tests on walnut bark? No, um, I had a friend uh, uh, in New Zealand actually, and he was boiling down walnut bark uh, to get the residue from it. This sort of sap yeah. effectively. Um, I, I I don't think he had much success, but no, it's not something I've used myself. All oh, right, okay. Um, I just was looking into the phenol, um, the phen phenol levels, yeah. the P H E N O L levels mm -hmm. of walnut in general, and I thought perhaps if we're not in a seeding seeded season at the moment, we could boil bark oh, or leaves. Yeah. yeah, I try. Okay. It, I mean, what's to lose? What have you got to lose? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, I think I, I think I haven't I I haven't done it, but you know maybe this will rekindle my sort of you know I did it yesterday with the dandelions or you know went out and got some dandelions and thought right I'll get some distilled water and mash these up and got a photograph. Yeah. Um, so you know I think I haven't tried it, but I, I think it may be worth worth the go if you're out of season. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to try it. I'll, I'll let you know how I go. Cool. Um, so uh, that's the that's the sort of um, starchy sort of bit, uh, and then for the salting um, with this, which is equivalent of the silver nitrate, I would use a uh, small amounts actually. Um, so thirty milliliters of distilled water, and that's what you would normally dissolve the you know the silver nitrate and you know everything into, um, and that is four to five milliliters of walnut oil, uh, pre prepared walnut oil. So um, depending on how many walnuts you get, or depending on how much, you know, what. To be honest with you, I've never, as I recollect, counted how many walnuts I put into say 10 milliliters of distilled water. It's just as much husk as I can get out of them. Um, now it's gonna be, there's a lot of fibrous and elements in there. So what I used to do, rather than using a sieve, which wasn't fine enough, uh, I would use a piece of muslin uh, and drip the mixture through that muslin. Um, and all of this is done in a dark room. There's no, avail there's no uh, available light, obviously. Um, so I put it through the muslin and I keep that in a brown bottle uh, as best I could. But I, I'd pretty much be doing this as I was doing the printing. So it's kind of sort of seasonal work rather than something I would sort of store these things long term. And then, um, because if you've put the uh, lemon juice or the lime juice in with your, you know, uh, salting uh, paper, you don't need to use it. You just use this uh, walnut liquid straight. If you haven't put the lemon in, uh, add it in, you know, 50%. So whatever 50% of walnut you're using, whatever walnut um, liquid you're using, 50% add the lemon juice or, or whatever into that as well. Okay. Um, and then coat. And I would always coat with a brush uh, or now coat with a brush. Back then I would just dip the whole thing in. Um, but it's very wasteful. So now I make it, I'm sort of very select, selective. Um, I don't, I haven't really got the means anymore for making darkroom negs. Uh, a lot of the materials that are available for making this kind of thing have gone. Uh, Agfa used to do brilliant uh, films that you could make uh, contact negs from. But a lot of people are doing it digitally. So, but I, so I tend to stick to sort of five, four, 10 by eight. Um, and that will give you enough for probably, I say sort of four or five, five prints, depending on how late, you know, liberal you are with the material. Now, it's very well mentioning all of these processes and things. It's good to identify uh, flaws, faults, things, you know, don't go right what, what, and why that might be. Um, you may end up with a mottling effect. So you end up with a very patchy print. 
Uh, that could be down to the regular sizing of the material uh, because it's all soaking in at different levels. Um, and then when you come to salt on top of that, say like say do the, the wall not on top, it's absorbing again down in different sort of degrees as well. And therefore it's potency, but it's also how it reacts with UV or change as well. So what I found by storing materials for quite a period of time helped. Uh, some people revert back to the gelatin sizing because it is more consistent than starch sizing. Uh, it depends on your own sort of feelings about using gelatin. Uh, but the gelatin size is always... Uh, do you want me to read through a gelatin recipe as well, Hannah? Um, is that interesting to... to Anybody? <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why not, That'd be great. So again, based on the Keepers of Light uh, recipe that I would use, my sort of go-to formula. Uh, so a recipe for gelatin salting uh, obviously uses animal gelatin. And I would generally mix up about 300 milliliters of water uh, and uh, between two and eight grams of gelatin. So you have to boil in the gelatin till it dissolves. Uh, so I would always use like a darkroom hot plate so once I got the hot water in, I keep it keep it hot, um, and you get a sort of almost like a sort of gloopy kind of uh, liquid, um, and then uh, some people add in, like in the starch version, they add in the citric acid at the same time. So once all the gelatin is uh, dissolved, uh, you, you you might want to add. There's several things you can add. You can add ammonium citrate. Um, but some people, you know, just use citric acid or um, and in terms of the sodium chloride element, which is the sea salt, uh, you put in the sea salt. So it's very similar to the starch version, but you're using gelatin and you have to dissolve the gelatin uh, prior uh, to the process. And just like the other one, you dip the paper in um, for about 10 20 minutes uh, into the sizing. Um, what I would tend to do as well is there's a process in dark rooms we call rocking the boat. So it's not this sort of furious agitation of the tray. It's just a gentle kind of rhythm that you would get to get us an even coating. And then you've got to hang it up to drip dry. Uh, it gets really messy because obviously as it's drying, the gelatin starts hardening out again and you end up with jelly all over this it's not it's not not the easiest it's a messy process and just like the starch paper you then uh, store that uh, away from sunlight now some people historically would rehumidify uh, their paper prior to um this this putting silver nitrate effectively you know putting silver nitrate on uh, i never rehumidified paper ever uh, prior previously because well I never had the means uh, to do it so uh, I never actually did it I found a way of actually working with the materials I had rather than trying to find another complicated element of what I was doing so that's the gelatin the gelatin one is very similar to the starch one other areas where you might come into is fixing so how do we fix a uh, uh, salt prints with sodium thiosulfate uh, I've known some people who, who wee on their prints. Uh, uh, not me, I'm a Puritan, uh, Presbyterian. Uh, so, you know, it's how do you fix the prints? So I tend to wash them. Uh, gentle running water, not a torrent. You don't need loads of water. Uh, do it at room temperature. Um, just to sort of flush out any unresolved uh, salts or, or etc. And just to clear that. Um, and then I would use a very, very weak, uh, if I was using silver nitrate, sodium thiosulfate mix uh, to fix things. Um, and then other times I haven't actually fixed anything. I've just washed it and left it. I don't think I actually fixed this. I keep showing you this, but it's the only one I could find. I had about 40 of them, so God knows where they are. Uh, so, yeah, it's... you, you and. and what can happen is people say a fading, you know, they'll see the image fade immediately. Um, it looks patchy, lacks contrast. Um, 
if it's fading rapidly, I think there's an element of you, you have, it hasn't been exposed long enough. Um, if it's patchy, it could be multiple reasons. It could be partly to do with the way that you had the things were coated. It could be to do with the way that things have been stored. And it could be to do with the way that things are exposed. So there's, a, there's multiple things. And I'm, I'm unfortunately, there's maybe just a process of elimination that you have to look at. And I think that's why it's really important to keep copious amounts of notes uh, of your process as you go. Uh, I think it's really valuable. Um, if you do get patchiness, as I say, it could be down to several reasons why. Um, it could be the paper stock you use as well, remember. Um, sometimes you know you get size, papers that are already sized. You get papers that are unsized. It depends on, I've always looked at papers like Somerset, Arch Aquarelle, Arch Platine is another good one. Um, so I think uh, uh, just looking at good paper stock and, and ask, look and see what other people are using as well. I think it's always, you know, part, reach into the community uh, and ask for advice on, on paper stock and things like that. Great, fantastic. I think that's everything, unless anyone has any final questions.